These four men have been called the peacemakers of World War I. Orlando of Italy, Lloyd George of Britain, Clemenceau of France, Wilson of the United States. We won the war, but lost the peace. How did we lose the peace? I'm not sure. Making war is hard, but it seems that uh, making peace is even harder. When wars end, people stop worrying. They assume that peacemaking is easy, automatic. We discovered it isn't. What was the end of World War I like? Do you remember? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. I remember it well. I was just 18 then, in 1918. I remember the headlines. And the celebrations. We went wild. Now we thought, no more wars, ever. Overseas in London, the same high hopes. And at Paris, too. But the armistice didn't bring joy to everyone. For the losers, the shocking realization that they had been beaten. No joy, no cheers. Instead, a time of troubles. In Germany, riots, revolution. We should have remembered this side of the peace. But we didn't. We were too busy at home cheering our victory. Our wartime president, Woodrow Wilson, was at the height of his popularity. Many Americans agreed with the reasonable liberal ideas he expressed so well. He put into precise, clear language what we vaguely felt. The peace must be fair, not harsh. That if nations worked honestly together, lasting peace was possible. His famous program of 14 points appealed to a war-weary world. The points covered four main ideas. No secret diplomacy. Limitation of national armaments self-determination for all national groups, establishment of a League of Nations to preserve peace by arbitration. These points were foremost among the proposals that Wilson took to Europe in December 1918. The visit to France attracted world attention. We were proud of our president and of our country emerging as a leader in international affairs. What did the Europeans think of President Wilson? Oh, mostly they welcomed him with open arms. Paris gave him a tremendous reception. But why? They didn't know him that well, did they? No, but perhaps to them he represented a fresh start, a new hope. And yet, as we learn later, Wilson's triumph was to end in disappointment. Wilson was only one of the delegates from 32 nations who assembled in Paris in January 1919 to write the peace treaty. The place was the Palace of Versailles, just outside of Paris. In this same palace, 48 years earlier, the beaten French had seen the German Empire proclaimed after the Franco-Prussian War. Now the world would watch the Allies make a new peace with a vanquished Germany. Leading their delegations were the so-called Big Three of the Peace Conference. President Wilson of the United States. Premier Clemenceau of France. And Premier Lloyd George of England. The Big Three, together with Premier Orlando of Italy, represented the Allied powers. To his surprise, Wilson, the idealist, found that shrewd Premier Clemenceau was opposed to Wilson's ideas of the peace. Twice, Clemenceau had seen his beloved France invaded by Germans. He honestly believed that revenge on Germany was just. David Lloyd George was usually a liberal, but he couldn't support those of Wilson's 14 points that conflicted with British policy. Thus, instead of harmony, 
Wilson found that the big three were not in agreement. After months of discussion and speech making, during which 58 committees worked out the lengthy treaty, it was signed on June 28, 1919, in the historic Hall of Mirrors at Versailles. Many of the peace aims that Wilson had hoped for were thwarted. Clemenceau also had to compromise his harsh measures toward Germany. But the treaty, containing 80,000 words, had been completed. Contrary to international usage, the Germans had not been consulted during the negotiation. So the peace made at Versailles was, in effect, a dictated peace. Yet, even though the Allies felt they had made compromises, the peace was written, and people celebrated the historic occasion. But the somber faces of the German delegates reflected their disappointment. The treaty handed to them wasn't the one they had expected from Wilson's widely publicized 14 points. They were angered and dismayed by the harsh terms they were to take back to Germany. By signing the treaty, Germany automatically admitted responsibility for World War I. Germany must make reparations of $30 billion. Germany must surrender her naval forces. She must never build submarines, nor build military aircraft and artillery. Germany lost territory, too, particularly in Africa. German colonies were placed under a live mandate. There were other changes. The map of Europe was changed by treaty, including the German Empire. Many new nations, including Finland, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Poland, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and Yugoslavia were created. With the treaty written, Wilson began the return trip to America. To many Americans and Europeans, Wilson was still a hero. But of his famous 14 points, only the League of Nations seemed possible to achieve. Wilson was returning home to fight for it. At first, he was hailed with enthusiasm. He returned a hero, not knowing that within a few months his popularity would fade. Americans rejected most of his ideas for building the peace. The United States did not join the League of Nations, as he had urged. As I look back now, I think everybody felt a lasting peace was a worthwhile goal, but we just didn't know how to achieve it. Most of us wanted to return to our everyday lives again. The Versailles Treaty did cause trouble later, didn't it? Perhaps it did help to keep some hatreds alive. It's hard to tell. My brother Frank told me about the post-war Germany he saw. There were shortages of fuel. There were shortages of food. And out of the disruption of the economy came disastrous inflation. The German mark became almost worthless. The future seemed hopeless. Unemployment, poverty, starvation were commonplace. National boundaries changed by the peace treaties upset populations, creating new minority groups and displaced persons. Certain statesmen, among them Charles G. Dawes of America, proposed relief loans for Germany. But this did not solve all the problems. The defeated peoples were ready to follow new leaders. Out of the strife-torn post-war years came a new generation of leaders who proposed totalitarian methods to solve national problems. The awful lessons of World War I were being forgotten. We had failed to write a lasting peace. What did we do wrong? It's hard to say even now exactly what was done wrong. 
But somehow after World War I, the seeds of another and even greater war had been planted. You mean World War II? Yes. When you study World War II, I think you'll understand that conflict a little better in the light of what you've learned about World War I. Thank you.